So uh, the first thing I have to do, uh, the company reminded me to uh, make sure that I'm very clear that I'm appearing here in my own capacity, giving my personal views, um, not necessarily the, uh, the company's views. So I wanted to make sure that uh, I cleared that right away. <clears throat> All right, so what I'm going to speak on is really giving, uh, hopefully, a very um, good perspective on the way that we deal with uh, emerging technology, the way we think about blockchain as one of our emerging technologies, and really kind of exploring that as we kind of move along in the future. I have a little arc of my presentation. You can see it here. So these are the, the main topics that I'm going to talk about as we, as we go forth. But let me give you a little bit of a background more into what my role is. I'm not only a vice president uh, at Discover, but I'm also the founder of Discover's Technology Innovation Office. And what we seek to do is gain authority over emerging technology so Discover customers can benefit through their use. And I think at the time when we created this, it was somewhat innovative. I hope it's a model that a lot of large companies really uh, look to follow. And it's really examining, first and foremost, technology through the technology lens. What can the technology do? And then finding and matching up the appropriate business cases. You know, for years, right, we uh, probably are educated in business schools and says, find the business problem and then fit the technology solution to that problem. And I had a different thought and was able to sell in the company. I said, we need to turn that on its ear, right? Think about something like, and the metaphor that um, I was able to kind of pull in was to think about tropical storms that eventually kind of uh, flow in and become hurricanes. And when you think of it in that way, right, there's a tropical depression becomes a storm and some storms become hurricanes. And some hurricanes ultimately end up, you know, creating some level of destruction. And what is the problem when the hurricane hits the shore, right? It is the hurricane itself and the, and the effects that the hurricane brings. And if we can think about emerging technology under that domain, under that lens, it really means that we should first think about the technology. And as it kind of sweeps over and washes over the company, you know, how do we kind of embrace that and make sure that we are prepared for the problem that that technology is going to bring? Now, let me also give you a little bit of background on Discover. Uh, Micah, in the previous panel, they touched on it. A lot of people know Discover from what Discover ultimately kind of gives today in the consumer business. Many people have a Discover credit card. A uh, number of people with uh, students have uh, gotten a Discover student loan or maybe have experienced us through the deposit products. But there is an equally large business, and in many ways kind of even kind of a larger business when you look at how many um, institutions we touch, is our network business. Discover owns not only the Discover network, which is the, the main one that you see here in the US, uh, we also own the Pulse Debit network, and we have the Diners Club International network. And with that, we have thousands of participating financial institutions here in the US and around the globe. And so when we think about our technology, and our emerging technology, we're not only doing, uh, exploring that technology for our B2C businesses, but we're also exploring it for our B2B businesses. And also in my role, I come into contact with many other innovation groups that are around kind of the US and the world. So today I'm really speaking to you kind of under that, kind of that domain, that perspective that we've had. Um, so my first uh, topic here that I'm uh, gonna talk about is blockchain really is a contact sport. Now, this is a play on words. You know, what do I really mean by this? In that we really benefit by having the contact with others in the industry. Blockchain is, is unique in all the innovations that, that my team looks at in that it requires an ecosystem to work together. So we've worked on artificial intelligence, and we can come up with a great chatbot or natural language processing. We can experiment with it. We can deploy it to a select unit within our company, and we can gain the value, right? Similar to uh, augmented reality and, and things of that nature. But when it comes to blockchain, what we can do internally is really something fairly limited, right? Because we need an ecosystem, ultimately, of participants. We need those contacts. We need to work together. I love the comment you know, earlier that talks about the fact that you know, we're kind of a, a frenemy ecosystem. You know, I think at this point, we're a cooperative ecosystem. We need to ultimately get all of our contacts working together today in order to kind of make that change going forward. <clears throat> the next observation that I, I wanted to, to uh, put forth is that this innovation paradox within large institutions is kind of always at play. Many of our organizations want to be disruptive, right? We want to have disruptive technologies. But as soon as we start to kind of work on them, 
the organizations that we work for, kind of the antibodies come out, right? The antibodies really were designed with the control processes, the regulation, uh, the legal frameworks to really reduce risk and control risk. And especially with organizations like ours that deal with everything at scale, we're very concerned when we all of a sudden want to introduce something that we don't really have necessarily the expertise on or the expertise at scale. So if you take just an example like with blockchain, when we first were trying to do some stuff with blockchain, even within Discover, all of the, the Innovation Council, which is the senior leadership uh, of our organization, is intellectually behind it, right? They say, you know, let's do it. And then we come up with a very specific idea, and you know, even our, you know, our CIO and others are saying, well, wait a minute, do we have all the expertise to scale? Do we have a center of excellence office? Do we have, and all of the barriers that you have to hop over just start to rise, right? They, they get in front of you. So the innovation paradox becomes in play that we want to do it, but we want to do it at scale and our expertise, we can stack resources you know, in the hundreds and the thousands on some of these legacy technologies because they're so well known in the marketplace. And so this is just a general problem that we have to deal with regardless of which technology, but blockchain in particular I think suffers you know, a little bit from, from this hurdle because, we, because of the first problem, we have to work together kind of in an ecosystem. The next item, and, and blockchain really suffers from this, um, I'm going to say kind of uniquely with the, uh, the innovations that I look at. And I've mentioned some of the innovations, by the way, like whether it was um, artificial intelligence or augmented reality or Internet of Things, um, a lot of authentication and identity. But blockchain really struggles in the business cases that we're looking at today we can't really kind of change the end result. So when we're first kind of experimenting uh, with blockchain, we're showing somebody what can happen with the exact, with a new technology that they're already experiencing kind of in an existing way. And you don't get really that aha, <laughs> gee whiz moment, right? You're trying to express that says, hey, blockchain somehow can Im improve the experience. I'm fortunate where I uh, live at home is uh, right by an estate called the San Filippo Estate. And um, the San Filippo has started a company called uh, the Fisher Nut Company, and he was a collector of all these years of these mechanical systems, right? So how do um, kind of automation work, uh, player pianos, and a lot of the musical uh, systems, kind of cool things like player banjos and things like that. And what strikes me is that what he did with a number of the pieces is they put a piece of glass uh, over um, uh, the part of this, so you could see the inner workings, like how in the world does the magic actually happen? And so what we had to do with, with blockchain is we had to put blockchain under glass. And this is, um, I think, an observation that I've seen a couple of companies do is you really got to somehow celebrate the mechanics underneath. And when the mechanics aren't visible, it's very hard for people to get excited. So spending a, a, an amount of time trying to express the value that is presently hidden is a real art that uh, I think we benefit from you know, with, within our companies if we can display I indeed how that works. <clears throat> All right, let's see if I can, okay. The, um, the next observation uh, I have is being ahead can put you behind. Now this really probably comes a little bit uniquely from the perch that I presently stand on and sit on. And that is we're driving technology innovation from first and foremost, the technology leadership, understanding the tech and how you can actually marry it to the business problems. This works very well in actually getting the right match, right, that says we haven't kind of uh, given a business unit necessarily false hope, but where it really struggles is trying to get now into the manufacture process because there still is this belief that somehow this new thing has to you know, create enough value and be able to be worth it against projects that are known and, and deliver. I don't know how many organizations uh, have, um, are using some method of agile processing, right? You know, a, a lot, right? As you go look out there, a lot of organizations use agile. And I've mentioned that agile kind of kills innovation. And it, it seems a little bit counterintuitive because agile as a, as a philosophy is one that you can move adept, uh, you know, quickly and you can make small incremental batches and you can move. But what it really relies on is an expression of value. And what um, is easy to value is things that are known and near. What's difficult to value are things that are unknown and far in duration. And so after we have a good idea 
and we can kind of fight our way into the manufacture process, we still have to now kind of fight the way up the manufacturing processing priority list in order to get stuff done. So you know, in, a, in a weird way, as we're ahead of the game, it really puts us behind in the manufacturing process and really requires kind of heavy internal sales that we have in the organization. All right, the next piece that I want to um, kind of express is really not so much of uh, a singular observation itself. It's really what we were able to do as an organization by matching blockchain to the right business problem. So uh, as mentioned earlier, Micah mentioned it in the, in the previous panel before the break, Discover is very strong in business-to-business -business payments. It's one of the things that we do. And in particular, um, commercial payments is a place where we uh, operate helping organizations, payers, and payees kind of connect and, and move their funds. And as part of this business payments uh, coalition, which we were uh, members of, we were introduced to an industry problem of really trying to think about how we could make um, that payment system um, kind of more efficient for payers and payees to discover one another and effectively kind of complete, complete a payment. And so in working with that, we said, you know, blockchain really seems to have a lot of the, the solid characteristics because it's not one organization that's connecting payers and payees. Payers and payees today actually work through their own financial institutions and kind of join a broader ecosystem today through all of the, the member banks in the organization. And, uh, and looking at what we wanted those independent organizations to do, which are known as the uh, kind of credential service providers, is they have to do things like anti-money laundering and, and know your customer and those types of uh, issues, but we were able to, to figure out a way that says this is kind of a federated model. It's distributed across a, a number of financial institutions and those who want to play the role of a credential service provider. So in, uh, in working with the BPDA and, uh, and a number of other organizations, you'll see, you'll see them here, uh, NACHA and Cognizant uh, has helped us. We have been able to structure a kind of a nice working uh, model of how payers and payees can discover them can discover each other and effectively uh, complete a payment. So with that, uh, better than I can kind of express the rest of it, why don't we go ahead and, uh, and roll the video. The current state of B2B vendor onboarding is quite inefficient and challenging for both buyers and the suppliers, increasing both costs and risk exposure for related procure to pay and order to cash processes. The Business Payments Directory Association and NACHA partnered with Discover and Cognizant to create a proof-of-concept solution, the Business Payments Federated Directory, a safe, efficient, and secure platform where buyers can simply look up the information that they need for vendor onboarding. The directory is a federated network of credentialed service provider subdirectories, where verified supplier information is stored and accessed. These subdirectories are connected together through a blockchain network, which stores the cryptographic hash of the supplier information. Buyers can find suppliers over the blockchain network and receive permissions to access their information. The permissions and notifications for the buyers are managed using smart contracts on the blockchain. The actual information exchange happens using standardized and secured APIs between the respective credentialed service providers. The received data is then validated against the cryptographic hash stored on the blockchain. The Business Payments Federated Directory is thus a completely reliable and faster way of obtaining the supplier information. To know more, please visit www.nacha.org slash B2B directory. Okay, so the... Um once again, this is a, a really a really nice collaboration model between the companies that you saw uh, on the slide. And I, th I think what's next for us in this space is really to get even more collaborators. As NACHA uh, begins to kind of scale and, and roll this out, right, other members are going to be participants in this, other banks that are going to become credential service providers, and they're going to play the role of uh, bringing on corporations who are all ultimately going to be a payer or a payee. So I think that's really a, kind of a great advancement to say, you know, here's a, a business problem uh, that we need to look at. The other thing that uh, was in this video, and I'm not sure uh, how well it was highlighted, is there's really kind of two aspects of the blockchain, right? We said there's going to be public information, information that organizations 
want to be discovered, right? Today, think about that as just a phone book, right? Where, hey, I'm willing to put my phone number out there, my physical address of my location, things that are, are very public. We want that on the blockchain, right? The ability to kind of discover and says, where is kind of, you know, that company? And then there's private information, things maybe like your bank account information that you want information uh, shared from. That's off-chain, right? That's still kind of locked uh, up in, in the secure uh, repositories and functions that organizations use. So we've really got this combination of kind of on-chain and off-chain. All right, so um, <clears throat> that's a little close on that. So let's, uh, next slide is really what I talk about is kind of, is, is what I'm kind of referred to as a manic future. This is really a bit of a play on words. Uh, we had a mnemonic, actually I created this mnemonic uh, well over 20 some years ago in the organization to represent a value chain that works within the payments industry. And you see the, the words on the bottom. It's a, a merchant and then an intermediary known as an acquirer. Then there's a network, which Discover is, is uh, typically playing in these roles. There's an issuer, which is an issuing bank and a card member. And it's these entities that ultimately need to work together in our ecosystem in order to uh, kind of complete a chain, right? And so, you know, when I kind of think about, you know, blockchain, these are the collaborators in my uh, direct industry that have to work together. And how do we think about some business problems that really fit naturally across this? They're not necessarily easy, but if you think about something about kind of a card member kind of purchase followed by a dispute, right? Somebody who later on says, hey, I was unhappy maybe with the goods that I've received and, and they want to kind of dispute the charge and maybe supply some evidence. You know, that is a very kind of drawn out slow process, right? We collect the evidence from the issuer that shipped over to the eventually to the merchant. The merchant either substantiates it or says, wait a minute, you know, there's a different part of the story and, and it kind of goes back and forth. And you would say something like this is really kind of ripe recognizing it in, your, in the value chain for uh, reinvention. It's going to take time because in the model that I just gave you, you know, there's tens of millions of merchants, right? There's thousands of issuing banks, right? There is, you know, tens of millions of, of card members, right? So, you know, the scale is, is kind of enormous. But we have other uh, businesses that have changed. So if you think about um, something like I'm close to also is the student lending space, right? The student lending space, it seems to be, well, what is it? It's a student and a lender. Well, students generally don't have enough credit, so there's a co-signer. And there's a financial uh, institution that's going to be the lender. There's a school who uh, wants to get the money. And there's uh, an intermediary. Uh, I thought Onum uh, yesterday presented another really nice kind of value chain, which was all around uh, cars and, and, and cars and, and the licenses. And I think they had seven different actors in there and, and kind of collaborators. So this is just really um, a way to say that we're always thinking about our future and thinking about the fact that we have this kind of complex value chain. This value chain requires these organizations to work together. And really a way for me to kind of, uh, kind of wrap it back around is I mentioned at the beginning that blockchain is a contact sport. And we really do kind of appreciate the contact that we're able to have here today uh, you know, with this group and really what the, uh, this entire kind of blockchain summit is able to bring to bring leaders together who are thinking about the organization. And we also uh, have issued in the bags that I've seen people carrying the different bags. You'll find a little card in there that talks about how to get a hold of us. Um, if there's something that uh, you think you can, um, we can do together, we're certainly willing to listen and explore and, uh, and see where it goes. So thank you for letting me share the uh, observations and perspective, and I hope they have a great conference.